All right, it's story story time again. In uh, I'm gonna say toward the end of 1993, potentially, Dad bought and operated a hot air balloon business for a couple of years. Uh, I think until the end of 95, that's when it went into receivership and whatnot. And so I would say, yeah, for all of all of 94 anyway, for sure, and perhaps a little bit into 95. Um, the receivership was at the end of 95, so I think he did some operating that year as well. Yeah, this picture here indicates uh, July 94. So anyway, this was a business that he really enjoyed because um, he was stressed out from uh, working for Corporate Canada forever. Um, he'd already had a heart attack, and so <clears throat> he wasn't really happy with what was happening in his life so this gave him an opportunity to run something that uh, would give a lot of other people you know unique experience and uh, something that they'll remember it certainly was that and um, the weird thing about this business was that uh, dad was extremely meticulous about researching things almost to the point of never getting around to doing anything because he spent so much time on research but so he did that for this business and looked at the weather patterns of this area, this area is around Orangeville, Ontario, it's northwest of Toronto. He looked at over 20 years of uh, daily weather pattern data and scoured the shit out of this to see how many days he could fly a week in order to judge the viability of this as a business. And the averages and the normal yearly um, wind is what you mostly are... are afraid of wind and obviously rainstorms and stuff like that thunder um so you're looking for calm days in the morning just after dawn normally and um, um into dusk those are the two flyable days because typically the winds are quiet quieter in those times of day uh, and also it's best to be cool because um the efficiency of hot air flight is better when uh, the ambient temperature is cool there's not you don't need to build up as much of a differentiation between the uh, temperatures inside and outside the envelope so after doing all that research he estimated i think it was that he would get no less uh, never less than two flying days in a given week and i think that he that was he was being conservative there that that would be the minimum um and after he ran the business for a while he found out that the weather in that period of time was not as consistent as that. And so some weeks they didn't have any flights. And so that really puts a hurt on the ability to uh, make a living at this. There was no lack of customers. I think, I think he said that even at the time of having to dissolve the company, he owed around 300 people, um, you know, guests who had already put money down. Um, so, yeah, it wasn't a lack of uh, business. It was uh, purely a lack of uh, acceptable weather for this type of flying. So I remember him being quite disappointed about that because he found something that he actually, you know, loved to do. And uh, if everything were agreeable, then I'm sure he would have, uh, you know, continued to do that for quite a while. I always found it to be fascinating. And whenever I did go and visit him in the summer times, uh, I would obviously help out and where I could and... You know, as a part of the crew with helping to wrap the balloon back up and uh, inflating it and getting it ready for flight and uh, obviously went on a number of flights over time probably only about six i'd say um yeah it was uh, it was quite enjoyable and, and different you know um dad enjoyed there's uh, some pamphlets coming up that dad wrote he enjoyed writing about you know the the mystery the intrigue the adventure and, uh, you know, just the overall, well, he mentions here, romance, yeah, adventure. So it is that sort of business, and it is that sort of experience. Um, hot air ballooning is certainly different than any other type of, uh, any other type of experience. Uh, this was operating out of the Hockley Valley Resort, um, which was a golf course and, and um, fancy resort area. Quite a nice... Um, little area I like it up there in Orangeville way you know big rolling hills and it's pretty nice up there
so they had a bit of a partnership. They would uh, sub advertise for each other. Um, uh, he sold some packages that included, uh, you know, a night stay or whatever at the resort so that people can get up early and come right out and uh, enjoy a balloon flight, which was probably the best way to go about it uh, rather than having to drive here from wherever the hell you happen to be. Because like I say, most flights are going to take off just after sunrise because um, that's where the best conditions are at. Um, and or before the sun goes down. So, you know, in the twilight, you still need some um, visibility and all that, so it's not in the dark, but um, but as the day is winding down, basically. The pilot that Dad had hired there, uh, extremely charismatic and, and just a plain character, a cockney. I couldn't understand a fucking word this guy said, but I could tell that he was all about ballooning. Real funny, you know, real interesting sense of humor on him and yeah just a typical dandy cockney ac accent big handlebar mustache you know waxed up uh, this guy was something else but really I, I really enjoyed him he was a lot of fun obviously has a lot of hours in ballooning even when he went back home to england he would come to canada and back to england um you know in the various seasons so um i believe he was really the only full-time pilot that i remember dad uh, having and uh, I briefly gave some thought to getting my license and stuff like that. Um, not necessarily just to support the business, because I was already living in British Columbia at the time. There isn't as much ballooning in British Columbia, or not on the island anyway, because of the terrain, essentially. I mean, sometimes there is one on the peninsula, but you got to be extremely careful not to go over the ocean or, you know, like you're on for the long haul if you, uh, if you end up over the ocean. And also, the, it's mountainous around here, and uh, there's not a lot of flat. It's a, uh, it's hilly, it's mountainous, so not not the ideal. Uh, the island's not the ideal ballooning place. Anyway, there's a very odd ending to this thing. Um, I mean, the sad ending is that um, the, the the company went insolvent, and uh, you know the the company had to declare bankruptcy, and that was a pain in the ass for dad, and you know obviously something that nobody wants to wants to do really. Um, and last year sometime, I happened to have found a picture that we just saw in the slideshow there, um, of the balloon and its registration number, which in this case is, uh, FFEV, Foxtrot, Foxtrot, Echo, Victor. That's its Canadian, um, registration. Um, I decided to, uh, um, look that number up. This was about a year ago. And what I found was a New Zealand accident report um, that outlined this balloon having been involved in an accident in around 2012, I think it was, and uh, killed all 11 people on board. Um, it's it's pretty fucking gnarly. So anyway, well, I'll go through a couple of the um, I'll go through a couple of the pages from this accident report here, and uh, for anybody who's interested in weird uh, accident investigation type documents, I'll, I'll put a link in the description for the, it's a 35 page um, accident report that goes into the conditions and the um, situations which caused this, uh, this accident. Originally I found the um, interim report uh, for this, it was the one that came up first, uh, but with a little bit more poking, I uh, I found this to be the final report. And here's a uh, general description of the balloon as it was at the time. Uh, this is not the same envelope, or not the same balloon section itself as what the original one was, but it does include the basket and the um, uh, the burners and Probably the tanks had been replaced at some point, but um, so anyway, this uh, shows us now a Cameron A two ten, which is which would be a two hundred and ten thousand cubic foot um, capacity. Originally, it was a Thunder and Colt one hundred and sixty thousand cubic feet. So. Like I say, it, it still maintains, um, this is this is the New Zealand registration now that we're talking about here, but um, it's almost the same balloon, let's put it that way. But at some point they had replaced the actual uh, balloon material. 
Yeah, and here we have a textual description of uh, when the balloon was manufactured. The 160A here that they're talking about, that is the original envelope that had been uh, sold after the um, dissolve of the company had been sold to New Zealand the, the, the same year, essentially. I think it was, uh, well, it was, what did it say here? Uh, 1996. So that's when it was re-registered. And then at some point, yeah, in 2001, it was replaced with Cameron Balloons A210. Cameron bought Thunder and Colt. There used to be two companies, basically the, almost the only two companies in the world making large hot air balloons. Um, but Cameron has since bought Thunder and Colt. So that's why when I was originally reading the report, I was getting really confused because I was told that the um, dad's balloon was of a certain manufacturer and then suddenly they were talking about it as a different one. So that makes more sense now. And then it mentions the makeup of the basket, which matches what I remember of it as well, with the pilot area in one corner and then two separate um, columns for the people to uh, to ride in. And the gas tanks are all on the one end with the pilot, <clears throat> and they hook up to the burners that are up above one's head. It says here the pilot also installed a small aluminum platform to provide easy access to the burner controls because the burners are quite you can't quite reach them you got to climb up a little bit to get up there if you needed to relight them or whatever but uh yeah so essentially what's being described here was the uh the balloon the dad owned and the, i'm pretty sure it's the same basket and all that stuff uh, by some of the pictures that i had all right this came out of the accident report where they were um making sure that the balloon was flying under its uh, weight abilities and it turns out that it is or was they looked at all the you know it's a pretty complete report you know they looked at all the conditions the weather the eyewitness reports how full was the balloon how much fuel so um, this is a before picture I don't know if this picture was taken in Ontario or in New Zealand um, but that's you know that's the basket that we're talking about So here is the description of uh, what happened, and uh, it's just a little section of it. There's there was many pages of the infinite detail of, of everything, um, but essentially it was flying uh, kind of low. The report says they don't think he was coming in for a landing, but for some reason was below the level of the power lines. And this is a thirty-three thousand volt line, so that's that's going to fuck shit up. Um, rather than de descend and try and get on the ground as fast as possible in coming up to these lines, he decided to try and climb over, which if you've got enough distance between you and the lines and the wind is not very strong, you might be able to do, but um, even though balloons have quite a bit of power, you you, you got to hit it big time with all the burners um, in order for you to start getting some more buoyancy, and so um, it doesn't uh, shit doesn't happen very quickly. And then uh, electrical arcing in the uh, lower part of the basket. There's also big metal cables that are holding the balloon together and holding it to the basket and all that stuff, sort of stuff. So there's an extreme chance of electrocution. Um, two of the passengers jumped out at a height of about 20 meters, which is not a distance really that you want to jump from. But uh, I suppose if you're getting your ass burned, Maybe it uh, maybe it'll work. As I mentioned before, everybody did die on this thing. So, um, and then of course, once the hot air did start to collect inside the balloon, it says here 110, 150 meters before the envelope caught fire, <clears throat> and uh, somewhere it also mentions that there had been a hole by the arcing. There had been a hole punctured in one of the liquid propane tanks. And you definitely don't want that. That's uh, that's going to be like a cutting torch, essentially. And it's saying here <clears throat> that uh, according to the manuals that the manufacturers uh, make for these balloons, they say if you are about to uh, come in contact with power lines, they're better off to uh, rapidly descend. Even if that means pulling out the... There's a 
I, th I think I called it the parachute, but uh, it's a huge circular patch in the top of the thing. And if you yank, there's a red, there's a red rope, and if you yank that hard enough, it'll pull that um, circular patch out, and uh, you will come down in a real hurry. We had to do that once in a uh, flight that was getting dark, and we were starting to come up on a whole row of trees, and we weren't sure how far that tree line went. And um, so in order to end the flight now, we happened to be over a place that was a proper landing site, and I'd say we were about 20 feet, um, not 20 meters. But um, it was a it was a it was a rough landing. But uh, it was you know it was understood that to, to to have gone back up and over these tree lines, we we wouldn't we weren't sure whether it would start to get dark, and then you have problems finding a good landing site. So it was the it was the thing to do. All right, here's what the tanks look like in the basket after they. Um, reassembled it and you can see it's pointing out the uh, place where a puncture hole is in the tank there so um, I mean that looks scary to me that looks uh, like a lot of fire and uh, pure liquid propane fire is can't be good I mean you already have it going out the burners but that's a regulated you know that's the good fire but uh, when you got blackened tanks like that you know it's bad um, also the pilot's right in there in between all that shit, eh, so he's the one that's going to be taking the brunt of that. All right, here's a summary of the findings. They found the weather was suitable. The pilot allowed the balloon to descend below the level of power lines, but he did not intend to land. Could not be determined whether the action was deliberate or not, but unnecessarily compromised the safety of the flight. It's highly likely the pilot knew the location of the power lines. So he'd seen them before. Oh, and had seen them before. Uh, he'd, he'd been to this location before, and it was speculated that he'd landed in that same general area many times. So they, they weren't sure why he didn't see the power lines. Uh, last minute change of wind direction carried the balloon toward the power line. That is something that's dangerous. Uh, if you're in close confines, uh, you go where the wind goes. You go in the direction of the wind. And um, so if winds change you, unexpectedly on you, then um, you gotta, yeah. It, it sometimes doesn't give you a lot of time to, to uh, do something different. And uh, pilot exercise poor judgment in attempting to outclimb the power lines. Electrical arcing from the power lines punctured one of the balloon's uh, liquid propane fuel cylinders, causing intense fuel fed fire that consumed the basket and increased the air temperature of the balloon envelope. Pilot's initial application of the burner caused the balloon to climb. Heat from the basket fire to a lesser extent to the balloon passengers jumping from the basket, which would have lightened the load. Uh, the lift caused it to break the power line it was, uh, that it was stuck on. Uh, once a collision with power lines is imminent, the recommended action is for the pilot to descend the balloon rapidly. Had he done so, there would have been a better chance of survival for the balloon's occupants. <clears throat> so anyway, that was just um, a little segment of, of what they found. There was all kinds of other findings and recommendations for safe ballooning, and uh, new rules also may have come as a result of this for the New Zealand um, aviation rules and regulations. Okay, here's where shit gets a little strange. An autopsy of the uh, pilot revealed that he had... Um, two micrograms per liter of blood of THC, which is the active component of cannabis. And uh, I pulled this little section out because uh, the New Zealand police um, wanted an independent or a second test of the urine and blood sample of the pilot in order to ascertain how much uh, this intoxication or potential intoxication might have contributed to the thing. Um, I like this section because um, according to their interviews with people who knew this pilot and various other um, stuff, they they consider his, his usage of cannabis to have been chronic, quote-unquote. I mean, uh, that's what heads call heavy cannabis users. I didn't realize that was a... Uh, I didn't realize that was the official term. Um, which does mean that that too micrograms per liter uh, might very well have just been 
in his body even if he hadn't smoked anything for two or three days. So the report is inconclusive as to whether there had been any consumption um, on the day of or or heavy consumption, let's say, the, the night prior. Um, this document spends a lot of time going into that. And uh, like I say, it's not definitive in its conclusion on that. But uh, it does say very specifically that um, that obviously drugs and alcohol are not um, things that should be used uh, in particular in commercial I mean not not for any reason but in particular when you have a commercial business and you're you're transporting uh, paying customers right members of the public you know I suppose uh, it's your own ass if you want to get stupid high and uh, and go up in a balloon by yourself but it's a totally different thing if you're uh, if you're in charge of other people's lives um, from what I've read I don't think the guy was smoking on this day I mean it was nobody gets up at 3 a.m. To have few people get up at 3 a.m. to have a joint before they go out on a balloon flight. Um, yeah, it just it doesn't seem uh, it doesn't seem practical. And if he is indeed a regular heavy pot smoker, then uh, basically the police are even admitting that um, chances are that's just built up in his fatty tissues and all that sort of stuff. I mean, you can detect THC weeks later. And so, in particular, if you use a lot, you know, if, or if it's been building up in your body, it uh, slowly releases that into your body over time. They also are saying here that even um, they retested three days after his death, and they were saying that probably just even as a, as a uh, factor of decomposition, that the f fats would be releasing whatever is stored in them into the body anyway, so... They're basically saying they're not sure whether that reading is accurate given um, the state of the body at the time and the fact that he's quote-unquote chronic. I guess what they're saying overall is that if you were a very, very infrequent cannabis user, um, there wouldn't be enough time for that to build up. And if you did have two parts per million or two micrograms per liter, in your body and you were not a regular user the indication would be that that was consumed recently and it may have been more conclusive that uh, the guy had been smoking on the day of the flight um, this was barely touched on in the interim report when I read it they, they, it was all speculative at the time so the final report goes very very heavily very deep into whether this guy was intoxicated or not uh, this is the sort of shit that's going to come up in BC here as uh, well in Canada as we get to uh, legalization um, and you know stone driving is going to become uh, a pretty serious topic. I don't know how they're going to deal with that because just like this report here is suggesting even if you can detect uh, THC in the bloodstream it, it lingers too long for that to be an indication that you're actually high right now. You know it may have been a week since somebody smoked something and uh, there's still some lingering, you know, lingering detectable, especially if they take a hair sample or some bullshit like that, because it's in there until it grows out. <laughs> you know? So I'm not sure how they're going to safely or accurately do any kind of roadside testing like that. I'm not aware of any kind of breath, you know, no short of drawing blood or urine sample. I don't know how they're going to do that. But anyway, this, uh, yeah, it's kind of a weird end to the story of Dad's balloon business here, but um, I was intrigued and, and shocked to have found this. Uh, this is, or this was, the second largest uh, aircraft death toll in New Zealand at the in 2012 when they wrote this report. The other one was a DC-10 that uh, that crashed. It had quite a few more people on board, but um, it wasn't full, but it, you know, um, so in a single aviation accident, this was the second um, second largest death causing accident in New Zealand history. So that's the story of uh, this for now. And uh, this is a multi-part thing because uh, I do have a video that CFTO out of Toronto um, went up to the Hockley Valley and recorded, uh, went on a, a balloon flight 
and um, I've got that on a VHS. I'm just having troubles finding a VHS that works well enough, but I will be transferring that, and um, I'll go through that and, and have some more stories about uh, about the balloon time. Um, I thought I'd split them up because they're going to be of different topics and whatnot, and, and in this one, you know, it ends strange anyway. There's no point showing loveliness after this. So uh, I will, uh, I'll talk soon. Do take care. Bye-bye.